Good evening everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Dawn and this channel is Dawn Does Keto. This channel is all about my accountability and my personal journey on the ketogenic diet. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, however, I sit down with my husband, Mike, and we discuss a book while we have dinner. It's called Dinner with Dawn. And Mike. And right now we are reading The Case Against Sugar by Gary Tobbs. So we just sat down, it's about 8.30. Right on schedule. Yeah. We were just having a hard time eating at a reasonable hour. Well, with the walking and yeah. trying to work and take care of my dad. I mean, there's just too much. There's yeah. just a lot going on. And we did get a little over three miles done today. So tomorrow, less than three miles, and we hit our goal of 50 miles That's for right. the month of March. Believe it or not, we're going to hit 50 tomorrow. We, did, would be we honestly didn't think we were going to do it. 2.75 tomorrow, and we'll be right on the money. We're yeah. A hair over. So we're just gonna show you real quick what we're having for dinner. We are doing pork rind nachos. So these are keto nachos. And I just have taco meat that I have made with keto chow taco soup. And these are gonna be really loud. You're gonna be hearing us crunching. <laughs> I put in one package of keto chow taco soup and I also added some primal kitchen taco seasoning to it. Mm -hmm. Do they taste taco-y? Yes, they do. Yeah, the meat has good flavor. Mm -hmm. Mike's just has the meat and cheese because that's all that he eats. I have some sour cream and some spicy guacamole on mine as well. Very taco-y. I didn't use the Hungry Heath taco seasoning today because last time I used it, I, I burned Mike's face off. Too hot. So what'd you do for lunch today? I didn't really have lunch today. I'm starving right now. I had barbecue pork rinds, two cheese sticks, and a beef stick, and water. That's kind of how my lunch was too. I did have my fat coffee. I had a baggy bacon. There was one left in there. And I had some keto brick. Oh, I did have one of those. The keto pucks. Mm -hmm. Mike thought that they were too salty. I love them. I don't think they are, but... I think I might get used to them if I ate a couple more. I mean, just like with electrolyte drinks, those were too salty when I first started drinking those too, but now I love them. This just had a lot of salt kick to it for such a small item. And when I bit into that, wow, it was a lot. I also had some fresh mozzarella today too. So it was the keto bricks, the fresh mozzarella, the baggy bacon, and my fat coffee. So I was watching James and Emily at Ready Set Keto. I was watching their video today that they released on the raspberry cheesecake keto chow and they made like little fat bombs out of it with two sticks of butter and a package of keto chow. They melt it together and then kind of make little pucks as well. Okay. So I think I'm going to try that this weekend and take those on my girls trip. Oh, I thought for a minute you said you were going to try it like make them this weekend. No, no, no. I'm going to make them tomorrow before I leave and take them on my girls trip so that I have something sweet that I can snack on if, gotcha. they're, if they're eating like cookies right. or, you know, something like that. Because although I said I was going to probably go off plan, like cookies and stuff like that, I just don't have any desire to eat anything like that. Most likely if I eat anything off plan, it will be more of like a savory thing, like the pizza or something like that. So I'm going to go ahead and take my own keto treats so that I at least have, you know, a sweet treat, but it would still be keto. So I'm going to make some of those tomorrow. I'm making them with chocolate toffee. So we'll see how those I think that out. makes a lot of sense too, because I think you'll be more successful when you come back by only doing the savory foods and not doing the treats because I think that'll be an easier transition to go back. If you were to enjoy a lot of off-plan sweets, coming back would be tough. Yeah. Like I feel like, you know, you would struggle more with that. So that's probably a good idea. And I'm okay with keto treats as a substitute. Like No, because they're know, fantastic. Yeah, most of them are really delicious. <clears throat> and if I'm having those, I'm not going to want to have the super sugar, right. sugar stuff. So. And it just goes to show the progression and the maturity and the discipline over the last two years. There was a time when you would have, you know, said, you know what, I'm going to have some of those off-plan sweets, and then it would have been a train wreck. Mm -hmm. But you clearly, clearly disciplined yourself. So I think you're going to do great. I think you're going to surprise yourself this weekend. There's actually a little bite to this uh, taco seasoning that you used. It's not mild by any stretch. It's For me, it's got a little kick to it. Is it too spicy for you? Mm -mm. 
What are you drinking? The citrus electrolyte element. The element? Mm -hmm. What do you think of that one? Very good. You like it better than the watermelon? Yes. He had watermelon yesterday. Yeah, I drank watermelon. So we got, you know, these variety packs of element. You know, there are certain flavors that I like. Orange, that's my favorite, you know, flavor. But the raspberry is good because we have a lot of raspberries. So I've drank quite a bit of that. That's because I normally buy raspberry because I like the raspberry. So. And it's good. But the variety pack had the watermelon. It has obviously the plain. It's got some exotic flavors that I will not try, but it also had citrus. I did the orange and I did the watermelon yesterday and it was okay. I mean, if that's all we had, I would drink it. Not my favorite, but I would drink it. Citrus, very good. Now Mike also adds a scoop of lemon Ultima to his element to give it more of a tart flavor. I only add the lemonade flavoring because we do that with the fruit punch zip fizz and i like that so much that i just feel like it adds a little di dimension to the flavor of whatever it is have that you you're... tried to drink one with just the element flavor i have yet? not no and i don't see any reason to do that <laughs> unless we run out of the lemonade which we might we will soon yeah we're gonna go ahead and jump into our book discussion because Mike still has to go back over and help his mom tonight. So I find it interesting. It says here that in the 1960s, researchers had discovered that people with heart disease were more likely to have abnormally elevated triglycerides in their blood. And they said another way to phrase it, that a high triglyceride count, not cholesterol, was the more common abnormality associated with heart disease. And I find that interesting because that was in the 60s and now now they talk about, oh, if your cholesterol is high or your LDL is high or your HDL is high, when really, even then, they saw that it's really just your triglycerides. And right now, that's the big focus. They're saying, you know, you got to look at your remnant cholesterol and your triglycerides and that those other numbers don't matter. Right. But at some point, they did come to matter and people, some doctors still, you know, make a big deal about your total cholesterol or your LDL or your HDL being a certain number when really at this point, you know, with all the research that I've heard, it's really just your triglycerides that you need to look at. And they saw that even in the 1960s. And these same researchers were also finding that the carbohydrate content of the diet played a critical role in what the triglycerides in the bloodstream were. In particular, they would remain elevated when people would eat carbohydrates, not fat. So from this perspective, dietary fat seemed to have little or nothing to do with heart disease. Yet this was before the big push for low fat and everything else. This was in the 60s. They were finding that fat had little to do with heart disease. Yeah, but it wasn't going to take them long to... But then the Sugar Association came along. Right, to get involved. And decided to make the fat the scapegoat, which we talked about in the first half of this chapter. So in order to reflect all the bad press and everything that was coming around about sugar, they had to find another reason or another thing to blame and fat became the bad guy. Well, sure, because they were looking at it already anyway. Mm -hmm. And so I think all these doctors saw this and the ones that clearly were on the side of sugar, they knew what they were going to do. They right. were like, you know what? You know what we're going to do? We're going to take this information that we have and we're just going to skew it a little bit and we're going to turn it towards the fat content. I said this in another video. They knew what was going on ahead of time and it was a clever trick. I mean, I'm calling it a trick that they were going to take information that they learned and they were just going to turn it and twist it because there was so much money involved in this. As this chapter goes on, it just is so blatantly obvious. If you've ever believed in, and I said this too, in any kind of conspiracy type theory, this whole defending sugar thing, unbelievable. And yeah. you're, you're going to see it as we progress through the rest of this chapter. So the Sugar Association first became concerned about the emerging evidence linking sugar to heart disease and diabetes in 1962. It said that the threat of competition from artificial sweeteners, particularly cyclamates, had made the research program on saccharin and cyclamates the Sugar Association's top priority because they were an immediate threat. And we kind of talked about this in the last chapter. And then we also talked about how the Sugar Association had different branches and they would change the name and, you know, different things like that. And how they were trying to recruit members to support and combat the accumulating evidence that researchers were finding against 
sugar consumption and how it was linked to heart disease and diabetes. So then in 1975, they were pulling their support and trying to figure out how they were going to spend their research money in the defense of sugar. But the effort to unite the world for sugar research was basically a failure. Right. It was not working well. But the sugar association would take back control of research in the United States and get the money to do so. This is the part I found interesting. And this is where I'm talking about. This is where it becomes solely a money issue now. It's just like anything else that we've watched. They're going to start pulling wads and wads of, of cash. They took back control of the sugar research in the United States and to get the money they enlisted companies among others were Coca-Cola, Hershey, General Foods, General Mills, Nabisco, Lifesavers, Quaker Oats, M&M's slash Mars, the Pepsi Company, and Dr. Pepper. And what do those all have in common? They're all sugar-based products. Yeah. A lot of cereal companies, obviously the carbonated beverage companies, some candy companies in there. Their livelihoods are at stake. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what it boiled down to. So they're clearly going to jump on board. So they were getting money from these companies to support their research and they also hired a legendary pr person he was a madison avenue public relations bigwig and it was their job to develop a public health campaign for sugar to help everyone realize the safety as sugar as a food mm -hmm. yeah they recruited a lot of people that were willing to join in in the cover-up and the deceit and the lies in the defense of sugar. And I'm sure, again, there's probably a lot of payola going on. Well, around the same time that they were launching this huge PR campaign, they also got some people who were part of the Food and Nutrition Advisory Committee. They were well-respected authorities on nutrition, medicine, dentistry, and they found all people who were willing to defend sugar, if necessary, in the public eye. Their job was to convince the public that sugar was a necessity it wasn't a treat and that there was nothing wrong with it yeah you're not addicted to it you just you need it and that was their goal look when you got doctors and dentists and you got nutritionists i mean these are educated people that are supposed to be looking out for your best interest health wise when you got them going on board because there's money involved and telling you things that aren't true and lying to the public, of course you're going to buy into it. You're going to believe it because that's what we're, I mean, we have to believe somebody, right? At some point. So for the longest time, that's what we were doing. We're buying into that. And that's why we talked about like with the cereal and everything else. I mean, they won those little battles early on, you know, the cereal companies and the Cokes and the Pepsis of the world, they jumped on board and they, they went full blown into it because mm -hmm. ultimately we're reaping the rewards and the, and the profits. And so when it got really dirty, like it's getting now, it's getting nasty now, they're shoveling money at them. Yeah. So this food and nutrition committee that was recruiting, you know, prominent nutritionists, dentists, you know, medical professionals recruited a, a gentleman named Edwin Bierman. It says here he single handedly was responsible for convincing the American Diabetes Association to liberalize the amount of carbohydrates recommended to diabetic diets and to effectively ignore the sugar content. He also professed an apparently unconditional faith that it was high cholesterol levels that caused heart disease, and this implicated saturated fats in our diets, not sugar. We've talked about this before, and I've had a lot of people leave comments about the recommendations from the Diabetes Association, even today, for people who are diabetic. The numbers are too high. They're telling people, you know, it's okay to have 100 carbs a day on the diabetic diet. If you're diabetic, you should be at zero. Mm-hmm as close to zero as possible. That's the only way you're gonna be able to reverse your diabetes. And they're just telling people that more is okay. Making it tolerable, keeping them on insulin and shots, keeping them on restricted diets and monitoring what they, they eat. It all ties into money. It's all big business. It hasn't started here yet, although I'm sure the beginnings of it were, but when you start getting big pharma involved, you got big food involved, you got the government involved, you got all these medical people. I mean, think of all those these different areas coming together yeah. in defense of one thing. Again, we said this, why would they go to this length to try to protect it if it wasn't because it was so lucrative? It's and all they don't, about money. And, and they didn't care about the health of anybody. Yeah, so it says that this Beerman was unequivocal on his belief that sugar and other carbohydrates played no role in the development of diabetes. He shaped the American Diabetes Association Nutrition Guidelines, which again are, are ridiculous. And, and we talked 
several chapters ago about the trend. He's sitting here saying that this has nothing to do with it and it doesn't contribute to it at all. But yet the numbers show us, the trends and the graphs all show us the increase in sugar, the increase of consumption, the increase of diabetes, the increase of obesity. I mean, it goes up steadily together. Right. And he was very adamant that the most important dietary factor that increased your risk for diabetes was your total calorie intake. So it's, it goes yeah. right back to the, the calories, calories, stuck on the calories, calories in, calories out. And it was irrespective of source. That means doesn't matter where the calories come from. It's the fact that you're eating too much. That's what's causing And it. we learned earlier that not all calories are the same because it's not calorie is a measure of used energy. And we use all calories differently. Right. They burn differently. They break down differently. And yet here we are, you know, fast forward however many decades it was. And they're going right back to that old research and that old way of thinking in defense of something that is clearly a lie. So that sugar association, that nutrition committee, the point man for that was a gentleman by the name of Fred Stair. He was a longtime chairman of the Department of Nutrition at the Harvard School of Public Health. In 1960, the nutrition department broke ground. This is where Mike starts getting into the whole conspiracy thing. And, the you know, you scratch my back, I scratch right. yours. In 1960, when Stairs Nutrition Department broke ground on a new $5 million building, the lead gift for that building was made by General Foods Corporation, the maker of Kool-Aid and Tang, and Tang breakfast drink. Just a little over $1 million donated towards the construction of that building. Keep now, in mind, this is in 1960. Now so why, why would a company take that much money and give it and invest it in a building for uh, a nutrition department mm -hmm. if there wasn't something going on behind closed doors? Right. So it says here that Stair had become the most public defender of sugar. He said it was not even remotely true that modern sugar consumption contributes to poor health. And here's something else that you didn't even highlight but to go along with that, more money was pouring in from others like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, the National Soft Drink Association. They even got money from the Tobacco Research Council because by doing so, they could also exonerate cigarettes as not being the cause of any kind of heart disease. They wanted him to include the fact yeah. that tobacco was not a that leading was, cause right. of, of heart disease. I mean, come on. And maybe it's because we know what we know now and I and I read this and I just it just I cringe. I feel like you can't be that stupid. You can't be that naive. You have to know. Look, Dawn and I have mentioned before, we're not smokers. Never have been. And I don't chastise anybody who smokes because it, it's tough. I get it. It's an addiction. It's tough. But I've always said this. Our bodies were not designed to inhale anything in our lungs other than the natural air that we breathe. That's what we were designed to do. So smoking is not natural in any way, shape, or form. That includes vaping. Right. So how can you go on then and do research and then say, oh, by the way, there's no health side effects. It doesn't cause any problems. I mean, come on. It's not natural. It's not supposed to be done by the human body. I'm just using that as an example because that's who's jumping on board here. They want to be exonerated too. They they see what's happening like, oh my gosh, look at what they're doing for sugar. They could probably help us too. They start shoveling money over them. This nutrition group also, a bunch of them got together and they wrote a paper. It was an 88 page paper called The Sugar and the Diet of Man. What they did with this was there was a conference that took place in Chicago in 1975 and they made copies of this paper and they included it in all of the press packets. So they immediately got their information to the media. Oh, yeah. Again, we didn't have it like it is today. You know, it wasn't just an email that circulates, bam, it's right. millions of people, but they knew what they were doing and they worked hard to do it. And then Mike talked in another chapter, we talked about this grass. It stands for generally recognized as safe and it's foods that are on this list and you want to be on this list right. because it means that your ingredient can be included in foods and different things like that. Right. So in 1972, the FDA launched their first review of whether or not sugar should actually be on the grass list. Right. But... The FDA used this paper that we're talking about for a lot of their research. 
So that doesn't seem like it's unbiased research. They're using the paper that was written by people getting money from the sugar company right. and using that as their, yeah, their, main their source basis. Of information. Yeah, the basis for whether or not sugar should be on the grass list. So it says the committee's review of sugar relied heavily on the Sugar Association's Sugar in the Diet of Man and its authors. So that's where they were getting their information from. Yeah, so I mean, already it's tainted. And yeah. now you got the government involved and they have the power to decide whether or not it's going to be on the list or not. So what do you think happened there? This review of whether or not sugar should be on that list, that went on for a long time. Yeah. Like this well, wasn't I mean, something that was decided overnight. No, because again, there was a lot at stake. The sugar industry itself was not going to just sit back and let them make a decision. Mm -hmm. They were going to do everything they could to influence that decision. And they did. Yeah, it says a bulk of the sugar industry's efforts went to continuing public relations battle, and they concentrated their efforts on the FDA reports. But it does say that in the early 70s, the Sugar Association would actually lose that next battle in the war. There was a gentleman by the name of George McGovern. He had formed a committee, so they called it the George McGovern Committee. The committee did primarily focus on the fact that Americans ate too much fat, so still they're going back to the, the whole fat thing, but it also recommended that the nation reduce its sugar consumption by 40%, and that was a huge hit to the sugar industry. Well, because, and as we read, they weren't expecting that. No. Because they thought they had the government and George McGovern in their back pocket. So they figured, especially when they came out and talked about the whole fat thing, they figured they had it made and McGovern pulled a little switcheroo on them. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, here's an issue that we have, but... It is fat. He did say that. Right. Like he, he but, didn't, yeah, yeah. He, didn't, he didn't blame sugar, but he did come out and say, we need to reduce the amount that we're consuming. And again, By 40%. And that was and a so pretty good was, number. Yeah. yeah, that was kind of a hit to the sugar industry and they were not happy about it. And that stayed in the revised edition of the Dietary Goals, which was published, was it published in 1977? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was pretty strict on that too. I mean, they tried to they tried to get him to sway and they or tried to get him to change, to his, change numbers his number and, yeah, yeah. and then revise it. But he he was pretty steadfast. And I don't know what that would have done in the big picture in the big scheme of things. But we've learned over the last several years being on keto about all the different sweeteners that there are. There's just hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. You you got to think that sugar consumption has gone down, but it's still a problem. Yeah. Even even if it's taken a hit, it's still an epidemic even today. And even if you have an artificial sweetener, you shouldn't be substituting that for sugar. I mean, people are eating like, you know, per capita, 77 pounds of sugar a year. And even if you switch that out, you shouldn't be eating 77 pounds of any... Of any sweetener. Oh Yeah, any no. artificial sweetener in a year. No. It's just too much. I tell you, it would be interesting and it would be almost impossible, but I would love to know how much sugar and sugar related products or sweeteners I eat in a year. <laughs> I mean, it would be really I don't know how, yeah, it'd be super hard to try uh, to figure I, I that know, out. It would but. be, it would be, but I'm curious, just knowing what we know and doing the best that we can to minimize our sugar intake, you know, we're not perfect, we're, we do it, but I'm curious. So I'd like to know where we are. You, I can tell you it's a lot less than you used to eat. <laughs> oh my gosh. Between the carbs, just pastas and oh, breads yeah. and stuff like that, and just plain old refined sugar, I mean, you're way down from where you used to be i can tell you that I, we haven't bought a loaf of bread in who knows how long right now that you know we've had bread products obviously i've had bread at restaurants and i've had we've had pizzas on occasional but we used to buy like two loaves of bread a week just as oh part, yeah every time we go to the store our regular grocery shopping and then think about all the cereal. We used to eat mm -hmm. cereal like crazy. I did. Yeah, I was never a huge cereal <laughs> person. Every now and then I would have a bowl of cereal, like not for breakfast. I honestly have never been a breakfast person. Mike would sit down oh. and, and he would have a bowl of cereal with milk. Toast and toast, juice. Toast, yep, a glass of orange juice. Like Every he had this. Day. He had this huge spread. Now, every now and then I would get a craving for cereal and it would just be like more of a snack or at dinner. I very rarely ate it like at breakfast time. I was more of a give me a donut for breakfast. It, not even breakfast, yeah. but like brunch almost like later in the morning or a pop tart or, you know, something like that. I'm obviously a sugar addict, but I mean, cereal has sugar in it, but I'm talking about like 
the sweets, the real, real sweet right. like pastries and stuff. So. And see, I was never a big fan of having a donut for breakfast or a, I mean, or a I, muffin or a muffin. Mm -hmm. I, I would just eat those throughout the day just to eat them. There was no real reason for it yeah. other than I just wanted one. You know, Pop-Tarts were the same way. When I was a kid, I didn't eat Pop-Tarts hardly ever. We, we just didn't get them. But as an adult, for we, a long we time, bought them every, we bought them every, all the time. Almost every week. Milk chocolate Pop-Tarts was my favorite. We'd buy the family size box of milk chocolate Pop-Tarts. And I would just pop them in the toaster and get a glass of milk. That's another thing we don't drink. We, we haven't bought milk in who knows how long either. It's amazing how much... Now that we know what we know, how much of that stuff we ate all the time. Well, and again, going back to sugar and advertising and the money, I mean, think about it with milk. We have recently discovered, first off, milk has sugar in it. Second off, as adults, we really shouldn't be drinking milk because we're the only mammals on the planet. We've talked about this before that drinks milk as an, as adult. an adult, right? But, and it's not even our own milk. We mentioned that. It's it's another animal's milk. Yes. But we all remember the advertising campaign for milk. Milk does, milk the, body does the body good. Yeah. I mean, that was genius because they are telling you right there that milk is good for you. You need the calcium. It builds strong bones. The vitamin D. We all remember that because it was so ingrained in our brains and advertising is just unbelievable. Well, and that's, again, that goes back to what they were doing here in the defense of sugar itself. They basically went on an advertising campaign. Mm -hmm. They hired the best in the business. The best PR people. Yep, well, again, I don't think he mentions it in here. I don't recall reading it, but there had to have been some payoff going on. Yeah. There had to be. He never really says it, and he probably can't because there's probably no evidence of that. Right, would be no my actual guess. proof. But they were definitely getting kickbacks. They had to be. Yeah. Why would you put, why would you stake your reputation? Some of these dentists and these, these medical professionals, they went to school for a long time to to get where they are, why would you jeopardize that? Well, and I even remember reading in here that eventually it does come out about his ties to the sugar industry and all the money that he had received. So it says here, they were using Stare as the front man to dismiss the anti-sugar sentiments publicly. And the Sugar Association noticed they were able to keep the sugar industry in the background and keep Stare's conflicts of interest in the background as well. But ultimately, that information started coming out yeah. and people started finding out his ties to the sugar industry. And so that made the information he was putting out there in this 88 page report, it made it very suspect for yeah. sure. It says it over and over that his funding was kept well in the background. There was a confidential memo to hold and use for inquiries about bias or conflict of interest in the report that was sent by the Sugar Association to the directors of communications at sugar companies across the country. And his name was slapped all over it. Yeah. It says in 1976, his copious conflicts of interest were finally exposed. Right, that's what I was looking by for. By an article, an article written by Michael Jacobson, founder of the Center for Science and the Public Interest. So as we said before, you know, there were cracks already starting to form and everybody knew it. And that's why they went on the defense here and that's why they spent so much money trying to cover everything up well we all know that eventually there's gonna be more and more people that want to know the truth and they start investigating and digging deeper and they did and it caught up with them and this guy was just one of them him and his two colleagues they went after stare for like three years I think they just brought him down they basically brought him down when you say that there was behind the scenes, you know, money, we don't, again, we don't know that there was any actual payoffs, but there were definitely conflicts of interest. Absolutely, yeah. And that was actually proven and found, so. So this chapter, it was a long chapter. It got really detailed in all the defense measures, all the money swapping, all the finger pointing. I mean, there's probably a good dozen people listed by name in this chapter that was involved in this whole thing. Not the most interesting to read. The information's interesting, but to sit down and read that and go through each individual s scenario, that was tough. It's a tough read. But again, you're building a case here against sugar and you have to go in there and you have to understand how much time was involved and how much effort was made they wouldn't go through all this trouble if there wasn't legitimate reasons why and, right. and that's what we're trying to find out here yeah so that's it for chapter eight guys and we will dive into chapter nine next week yes you're getting a little break this weekend this thursday so enjoy that i mean i'm going to enjoy it as well i mean i'm not going to enjoy the fact that dawn's going to be gone for four days 
He's not going to miss me at all. Because I don't like to be by myself. So, <laughs> and I'm not real fond of my dog because my dog's getting old and he struggles. He's not as lovey-dovey as he used to be. So he probably won't want to hang out with me either. <laughs> he just wants to go to the bathroom. He just wants to, <laughs> yeah, he just wants to go to the bathroom. He's getting do? doggy dementia <clears throat> and he just seems very confused all the time. And he'll like walk into a corner and then not be able to get out of the corner. It's just... So you're constantly like telling him what to do and trying to guide him. So he just lays and, down a lot. Yeah. So anyway, I hope you guys all have a great weekend. And I will see you in Tuesday's video, which will just be like a regular Tuesday update. Right. That and that'll be the one do. that you look forward to very much. <laughs> I think we all are going to look forward to that video. Oh, my way. <laughs> it took yeah. me a second. My way in on Monday after We're all going to be curious to see how your weekend went. I mean, let's be real. We are. Yeah because we know you're gone, you've made a commitment, you've also said, hey, look, I'm gonna enjoy the weekend and I'm gonna go off plan a little bit. So I think as fans of your channel and also because I'm your husband, I think we're all looking forward to see how this turns out. And hey, look, I told you also, you're not gonna be here to kind of help keep me on track. I'm just warning everybody out there, I am probably not gonna do real well this weekend either because do I Do you anticipate yourself completely going off the rails? Like have, you're not gonna eat keto at all? No, but I don't have anybody here, anybody here to even say, Mike, what are you doing? Our kids well, are gone the and there is, won't be anybody here. Mostly, you know, we eat at home and when we cook, we always eat keto, but I won't be here and no, we won't be eating at home. That's what, so. I mean, probably not. We have a hmm. few things that I can make I think we've explained this a million times. Neither one of us like to cook. And if you're not here, that makes it even easier not to cook. So it's going to be an interesting weekend for us both. Yeah, so stay tuned, everyone, for, <laughs> for that, the, entertaining the, the Monday weigh-ins yeah. for both of us, actually. If you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done that already. Hit the bell notification. That way, when our next video does come out, you will be alerted to it. Bye, guys. Good night.